Calling all cars, the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Diego police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 56, a holdup and a murder. Suspect driving a Pontiac Coupe, license 1454022. 1454022. Last seen in the vicinity of 4th and B Street. Stand by for further information. That's all. On the busiest street of the West's largest city, streams of traffic speed endlessly by. At the intersection of a quiet side street, a car waits impatiently for an opening to cross the boulevard. For heaven's sake, Henry. We shan't wait all day. Can't you edge into that traffic? They'll stop for you. Not those wild-eyed drivers. I'll wait for an opening. Well, here comes one now. There's a clear space. Get across quick. All right. Henry, look out! Hurry faster! Oh! Oh, Get that All right, all right, make another room here. Back up, everybody. Let's get these people out of here. Well, how about it, mister? You okay? Yes, I, I, I guess so. Marie, are you hurt? No, but it's not your fault I'm not, Henry. Along the crazy drivers. I couldn't help it, Marie. I tried to get out of the way. The car seemed to stall. It jumped and, and then it stopped. Well, you're all right now. Step over here or I can make my report. All right, get going. Move along, you. Come on. All right, now you say your car stalled, eh? Just when you were trying to get across in a hurry. You're probably using a lot of cheap gasoline. Maybe it was the gasoline. You ought to use the gasoline you can depend on in emergencies. Is there such a thing? Oh, sure. Look at the punishment our police cars take. We snap them from a crawl to top speed 50 times a day. They used to sputter and jump, too, and we found a gasoline that wouldn't stall in emergencies. Why, what gasoline do your police cars use? Huh? Well, I thought everybody knew that police cars use nothing but Rio Grande crack gasoline. Oh, yes. Yes. I remember. Police car performance, of course. Sure, you can't save any money using cheap gasoline. I'll bet police cars get more mileage with the real grandy crack gasoline than you do. And our gasoline won't fail in emergencies like yours did. Say, are you selling real grandy crack gasoline? <laughs> well, maybe us cops are a little too enthusiastic about it, but that gasoline has helped us out of a lot of jams. Let's get this report. What's your name? Oh. <laughs> Tonight, we are honored to have in our studio as our guest, Chief George Sears of the San Diego Police Department, who has a message for you. Chief Sears. Good evening, friends of the West. This is the first time I've been privileged to address you on this great radio program since I became chief of the San Diego Police Department. Some time ago, our department was honored by calling all cars, and the Ala Caliente money car holdup was dramatized. Tonight, I am happy to bring you another spectacular case from the files of our department. The moving picture murder, a cold-blooded killing, which we relentlessly investigated until we had the satisfaction of seeing complete justice done. It took five years to get the second member of the murder to do it, but never during those five years did our vigilance lag nor our determination weaken. And in the end, we got our man. How we got him, you are about to hear. On with the show. Well, picture, I get an awful thrill out of these gangster films. Well, I don't like them. It's silly, I guess, but they scare me. Ticket, first aisle to the right, please. I never did like guns. Oh, I don't mind them. I like pictures with lots of guns and fights and things in them. Well, I don't. The tickets, please. I haven't got a ticket. I want to see the guy with the dress suit. What? The guy in the dress suit, the manager of this theater. Oh, well, the manager isn't here right now. He'll be back in the morning. Ah, well, that don't do me no good. Who is here? Well, the assistant manager, Mr. Malloy, is in his office, I think. Okay, he'll do. Where is his office? Right up those stairs and then to the right. I'll go up and see if he can see you now. Well, I'll go with you. 
Oh, here it is. If you'll wait just a minute. Don't worry, I'll wait. Come in. Mr. Malloy, there's a man outside, and he says he wants to see the manager. Well, what does he want? Well, he didn't say, Mr. Malloy, but I don't like the way he's acting. It sounds as if he were drunk or something. Well, send him in, Miss Snyder. I'll soon find out what his trouble is. Yes, sir. Well, maybe Willis and I better leave while you talk to this bird. Yeah, Joe. Henry and I will take a stroll around the block. No, no, no. Stay here. I don't know what this fellow wants, but it'll probably only take a minute or so to find out. This is Mr. Malloy. Uh, come in. Thank you, Miss Snyder. You may go. Yes, sir. Well, what can I do for you? Take but... up your hands. I mean this. I don't want any monkey business. Stick them up. Look here. This isn't going to do you any good. All I have to Stick do is... Stick up your hands and shut up. Open that safe over there. I'm sorry, but I can't. Open that safe. I don't know the new combination. It was changed yesterday. Don't hand me that. You got the combination. Well, all... Nation. 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 Well, all right. Keep your hands away from that pocket. Oh, As the mortally wounded assistant manager falls to the floor, the cold-blooded killer wheels, rips the door open, and disappears into the darkness of the theater corridor. Stunned, Malloy's two companions stand horrified an instant. Then Peterson springs to Malloy's side as Greg rushes through the door, down the stairs, and out through the theater entrance. Just in time to see the killer jump into a coupe with another man and drive away. Greg leaps into his own car and starts in pursuit of the fleeing bandit. Down through the middle of the San Diego business district roar the two cars, skimming through traffic, ignoring stop signs. At the corner of 4th and B Street, Greg is forced to abandon the chase when traffic becomes too congested. However, he has memorized the license number of the other car, and armed with a good description of the killer, he goes to the police station and reports the shooting. In the meantime, back in the manager's office, Peterson has called the police ambulance and is waiting for it to arrive. Somebody get oh. There. You're going to be all right, Joe. Why doesn't that ambulance get here? Where's the man that's hurt? Right in there, doctor. Okay. All right, let's take a look here. You lost an awful lot of blood, doctor. I, I tried to stop it, but I, I'm afraid I couldn't do much. Oh, you're right. You couldn't do much with that hole in his neck. It looks like it went right through the jugular vein. Fleming, you and Adele get a litter and get him over to the hospital as fast as you can. I'm going to have to operate soon or there won't be any use doing it at all. What do you think, Doc? Will he pull out of it? Well, that all depends on how soon we can get him to an operating table. All right, all right. Clear the passage there. Come on, come on. Make room. Someone keep that mob back until we get out. Wait a minute, Fleming. Wait a minute. Set him down. We can't wait to get him through that crowd. I'm going to operate here. Good Lord, Doctor, you can't do that. You haven't got any facilities. You haven't even a nurse. It's the only chance. He'll be dead in another 20 minutes. Fleming, keep these people back and get a light. No, but Doctor, you if can't... If you want to help your friend, the best thing you can do is stay here, be quiet, and do exactly as I say, understand? Yes, sir. All right, hand me that bag. Here it is. That's right. Fleming, you hold that light over here a little where I can see what I'm doing. There. Wait a minute. I want to ask you people to be as quiet as possible. This man's no. life depends Somebody on all of you. Something. Let's look. Somebody take that woman away from here. Now, well, if we can just get this juggler tied together. There. Hand me that hemostat. There. All right, boys. That's the best we can do for the present. Let's go. What do you think, Doc? He's got just one chance in a thousand. <laughs> But despite the efforts of Dr. Bruce, Malloy dies as the ambulance roars through the streets of San Diego towards the hospital. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Detective George Sears and Detective Sergeant Frank Bow of the San Diego Police speed to the scene of the shooting, and there, surrounded by scores of curious onlookers, question the witnesses, Miss Snyder and Mr. Peterson. Henry Peterson. That right? Yes. Now, Mr. Peterson, I'd like to ask you a few questions. What did the killer look like? Well, I, I'd say he stood a little under six feet. I guess he weighed uh, somewhere around 145 pounds. Uh, how old would you say the man was? Well, I, I don't think he was very old. Around 26 or 7, I'd imagine. 26 or 7. Anything about him that might help us identify him? Any peculiar manner of speech or accent or scars of any sort? Why, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, he had a scar of some sort in his upper lip. Looked as though it might have been a hair lip operation. That's good. Now, how was he dressed? Well, he had on a uh, sort of a reddish brown suit. Uh, I don't think he had any hat. No, I'm sure he didn't. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. This will be a great help in running that man down. The 
two detectives return to headquarters and turn in their information. Within ten minutes, the call is being flashed to every available officer on the force. Stopper police guards are placed in all main arteries leading from the city and warned to look for the Pontiac Coupe, license number 1454022. With mechanical precision, the police organize a dragnet that completely covers the city. At the corner of 5th and University Avenues, motorcycle officers Comstock and Remington stop to call in to Central Station. Remington, corner of 5th and University. What? Yeah? Yeah, at the Fox California Theater. Yeah. Shot, eh? Yeah, wait a minute. Hey, take this license number, Archie, will you? Yeah. 1454022. You got it? Okay. <clears throat> I'll write it down over here under the street lamp. One four five four zero two two. Right. All right, we'll watch for it. What's the dope, Tom? A uh, fellow shot an attempted holdup. Died on the way to the hospital. Well, we might as well do a little cruising around. You can't tell when we might. Tom, look at this bird coming down university. Boy, he's really traveling. See if you can get a good look at his plates as he comes up. Yeah. I can see him now. One four five four. Say, Archie, that's the bird we're looking for. Well, of all the lucky... Come on, Tom, let's go. The two officers jump on their motorcycles and start after the fleeing car. At the next block, it pulls up for a boulevard stop. Comstock orders it to over to the curb. The driver looks back, hesitates, then starts to obey as Comstock climbs off his motor and approaches the car, he's met by a hail of bullets. A sudden shock in his right shoulder and he spins, grasps for support and then tails to the street. His partner, Remington, opens fire as the driver of the bandit car hastily throws it in gear and careens off down the street, leaving a trail of whining bullets directed at Remington, who, stopping only long enough to ascertain that Comstock is not badly hurt, leaps on his motorcycle and continues the chase. The night air of San Diego was suddenly split by the scream of guns and sirens, the powerful roar of motors, and the deadly crack of revolver shots. Homeward bound workers, groups of party bound revelers, homeless tramps, stop in the street, transfixed with excited thrills as the death car and its blazing pursuers scream by. As they near the waterfront, a low fog suddenly blankets the streets, hiding everything in its shroud like gloom. Unable to see, Remington is forced to abandon the chase. He runs into a drugstore and phones headquarters, asking that every available police car, motorcycle officer, and detective be sent out to the immediate vicinity. Realizing that the killer and his driver cannot get far in the fog, he dashes back to his motorcycle and blindly rides up one street down another. Suddenly, directly in front of him, a car looms up out of the fog. Jamming on his brakes, he climbs out and, gun in hand, approaches it. The car is empty. Remington makes a more thorough examination. It is the deserted murderous car. In the back seat, he finds a blood-stained cap. His speeding bullets have not all been wasted. Twenty minutes later, a blockade has been thrown around the area, covering a section five blocks square. Policemen hurry through apartment houses, private dwellings, every place that might possibly be used as a hiding place for the fugitives. Police dragnet slowly narrows the search down to a cul-de-sac, a canyon-like ravine that runs for a block behind a row of apartments. Searchlights are set up on the edge of the cliff, and while their startled beams stab the fog and darkness with pencils of light, officers beat through the heavy underbrush, clubs in one hand, guns in the other. Behind one of the powerful searchlights, Walter D. Wilson, an ex-serviceman and friend of the police, is swinging the beam of blue-white light back and forth along the edge-like ravine. Standing by him, a companion strained his eyes, looking for any suspicious movement that might mean the killer's hiding place. See anything? No, it's so foggy down here, it'd be a miracle to find anything. Reminds me of some of those nights in France. Yeah. It's cold around here. Wish we had some coffee. Hey, Walter, swing that thing over to the right a bit. There, hold it a minute. See something? I couldn't be sure, but it looked like someone moving around. No, probably just a shadow. Nothing moving now. Might as well turn it back where it was. Yeah, I guess it was just my nerves. Kind of gets you standing out here peering into a gully all night. Wait a minute. You see that clump of bushes over there? The beam of my light just swept by it. Shoot the light back there. Wait a minute. I'll pull the gag we used to pull at the front when we were looking for enemy patrol. 
You keep your eye glued on that spot. I'll swing the light up the ravine and then snap it back there and see if I can surprise them. Okay. All right. I'm up at the end of the ravine now. There he go. There he goes. Make him to the back of that apartment house. Hey, boys, there he goes. Into the basement of that brick apartment. Go get him. Hurry. Hey, hold that light on him. Come around to the side of the kill. Hold my boy. Let's get him. officers close in on the apartment building. The basement is pitch black. Anyone going in the door offers a perfect target for the desperate gunman. Finally, Detective Sergeant Hughes and Deputy Sheriff Blake decide that the only thing to do is to go in and take the chance. With complete disregard for personal safety, the two men check over their guns, take a last look around, and then start sneaking up on the silent entrance. Easy now. You got a pretty good chance of getting a crack at him before he has time to shoot. Right. If he sees us first. Oh, well. All set? Yeah. Let's go. So far, so good. See anything? Nothing. Blackie, look. In the corner over there beside that barrel. What is it, a shadow? We'll soon find out. Come out of there, you. Come on, step out of there and make it fast. I am warning you, if you don't come out of there in ten seconds, I'm going to let you have it. Look out. He's got a gun. All right, you ask for it. Skyler C. Kelly arrives at the scene a short time later and from papers found on the body identifies it as that of Otto Andrews Morrissey, who lives on 8th Street, San Pedro. The appearance of the man, however, does not tally with the description given by the witnesses. This, then, is the body of the killer's accomplice, and the wanted man is still at large. All through the rest of that night, the manhunt continues. But by morning, it is obvious that somehow, perhaps during the excitement of the shooting... The real killer has managed to slip through the blockade. Meanwhile, San Diego police have traced the license plates and find that they are registered to one Stan Kramer of San Pedro. Los Angeles police are notified, and within a short time, officers from the San Pedro division arrive at Kramer's address. Well, this is the place, all right. I wonder which apartment the guy lives in. Yeah, that's the manager. Here's her apartment. How do you do? We're looking for a man by the name of Kramer. Stan Kramer. Does he live here? Yes. He's in apartment 203. And is he in? Yes. Mr. Kramer's been ill for the last week. Well, if he's in, we'll just run up and say hello. Come on, Harry. Okay. Mm. Sort of let him out. Been sick for a week. Yeah, well, maybe it's all a stall. You know, I don't trust landladies when they speak English. Well, here we are. Now, on your toes, Harry. Maybe Mr. Kramer won't be so glad to see us. Here, push that bell. Police officers, they want to ask you a few questions. All right. Wait a minute. Now what do you want? You know a fellow by the name of Morrissey? Otto Morrissey? Never heard of him. Never heard of him, huh? What kind of a car do you drive? I haven't got a car. I can't afford one. Oh, you haven't got a car, huh? No. And how does it happen that a Pontiac Coupe registered to you shows up in a beef in San Diego? I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't been out of this apartment for over a week. You must have the wrong Kramer. Now, listen, there's no use of beating around the bush. If you want to save yourself a lot of grief, you better start talking. I don't know what this is all about. I've been right here in this apartment. All right, Kramer. We know all about that, and we also know all about you. Get some clothes on. We're taking you down to headquarters. Hey, you can't do that. I haven't done anything. Well, then come clean. Isn't it a fact that you do own a car? No. Don't lie to us. You own a Pontiac Coupe, license number 1454022. All right, all right. What have I do? What's wrong with a guy owning a car? Well, there's nothing wrong with a guy owning a car, Kramer. The only thing wrong is when that car is used for a hold-up and someone gets bumped off. You're under arrest on suspicion of murder. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't have anything to do with any hold-up. I, I thought you guys had a bootlegging rap on me. That's why I didn't want to let you in on the fact that I owned a car. All right, then. Tell us all about that car and make it fast and through. Well, I, I've been doing a little bootlegging just on a small scale and I have a guy delivering for me. He's been using the car for the last few months whenever I didn't need it. Yeah? Go on. 
Well, last Sunday he came to me and wanted to buy the car. I wasn't going to use it, so I told him to go ahead. Did he have anybody with him? I don't know. He was alone when I talked to him. Hey, what's this helper's name? Say, listen, if I tell you guys all this, is anybody going to know who spilled it? I don't want to get a slug in my back. But if you mean Morrissey, he won't bother you any because he was killed in San Diego trying to get away from the police. Otto's dead? Yeah, I thought that would do the trick. All right, spit it if you know what's good for you. Okay. The guy you want is probably Jim Durant. He was the other guy that borrowed the car. Hey, that's more like it. Have you got any pictures or anything that might help us find him? I think there's an old passport around here. He used to be a sailor before he got into this ragged. Well, suppose you take a look around and see if you can find it. And don't try to pull anything fast on me because I got this caught on you all the time. Okay, okay, that ain't necessary. Well, I'm the best judge of that. I think he stuffs over in that suitcase in the corner. Yeah, here's all his junk. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. There's some letters and some other stuff here, too. Well, that's swell. It looks like Mr. Durant's days are numbered. When the photograph on the passport is shown to Miss Snyder and Mr. Peterson, they positively identify it as the man who had shot Malloy. The San Diego police, now that they have photographs, fingerprints, and description to work with, prosecute the search with increased energy. But first days, then weeks, and finally months go by with no sign of the fugitive killer. $600 is spent on postage to mail circulars to every city, town, and county in the United States. Newspapers carry pictures of the wanted man and offer a reward for information concerning him. But no word is received. Durant has disappeared into oblivion. Five years pass. It is March 1st, 1933. A little clothier's shop in a small town in Utah has just opened its doors, and the proprietor is sweeping the sidewalk out front when a customer approaches. Morning, Dad. What do you got in the way of suits in this shop, huh? Something snappy. I got just the whitest thing from New York, the most beautiful suits you ever saw. Well, let's go and take a look at them. As good as you say, I might buy one. Yes, sir. Come right there. All right, Dad. Let's see some of the snappy New York scenery, you know. Here. Here I got the piece goods that sells anywhere else for $50. I'll let you have it for 30 Oh, nuts. Saw the same thing down the street for 25 Oh, I guess I don't want any of your wait, stuff. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Waitmans. I-, I show you something that you like and cheap. Oh, you couldn't beat it. Here, gin, you wine, home spun. Feels are good. The best you could find for the money. How much? Well, for you, I make it twenty dollars. And at that price, I'm losing money on it. But I give it to you if you want it. Well, I'll think it over for a day or so. And if I decide yes, well, it's so. Listen, I'm telling you, you couldn't all lose it. All that. right, all right. I said I'd think it over. Hey, uh, how much are ties over there? Those ties? Yeah. Hmm, only 50 cents and the best in the country. Yeah? Uh, bring them over here. Let me see them. All right. Right away, I'll get them for you. Yes, sir. Uh, while you're over there, you might uh, get me some handkerchiefs, too. Uh, colored ones, you know. Oh, you bet. Here, I got some handkerchiefs. <laughs> uh, you're going to like these. They're blue. It would look good on you. Yeah, not bad. Well, uh, I'll let you know about them when I decide on the suit. But, 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 but you ain't going to buy no things this morning? No, I'll see you tomorrow. So long. No, goodbye. Schlimmel. <laughs> you mess everything up and then don't buy anything. So what? I got to straighten up this stock once all over again. Yeah, what's this? There ain't no gloves in this drawer. But I put some there myself this morning. But they ain't here now. Maybe I'm getting absent-minded. But I was positive I put some of that draw this morning. Two days later, the suspicious proprietor is about to close up for the noon hour when the annoying customer again enters his shop. This time, the proprietor, keeping his eye on him, sees the man reach into a drawer filled with tie pins, studs, and collar buttons. Excusing himself for a minute, he goes to the door, beckons to the first man he sees, and asks him to phone the police. 
He then goes back and stalls the customer until the police arrive. Here. This man here is a thief. Why are you lousy oh, little... Quiet down, quiet. What's it all about? Two days ago, I missed some gloves. This man, he was in here and I talked to me about buying some clothes. And when I found the things was gone, I thought I'd made maybe had a mistake. But today he comes back and I watched him and he started to steal some other things when I didn't think I was looking. Say, this old guy is nuts. Well, I never saw him before in my life. See, I got a good notion to smack you right in the uh, nose, uh, you uh, meddling uh, old... Uh, uh, what's your name, mister? Oh... Ralph Hill. Where do you reside? Well, that's none of your business. I don't have to answer any questions. You haven't got anything on me. Well, yeah, it's getting mighty hot under the collar for a young fella that's done nothing. I think I'd better take you along down to the station. You can tell us all about it down there. Hey, listen, you've got no right to doing this. I know my rights. All right, all right, all right. You can tell all that to the sergeant. Now, before you should take him away, officer, could you maybe get back for me those things he just lifted from that drawer? At the police station, the irate shoplifter is about to be booked for theft when an alert sheriff notices something familiar about his face and looks through the bulletins of wanted men. Suddenly, he stops before one marked B-8078, wanted for murder, James Durant. The end of the long chase is at last reached. The Utah police notify San Diego and Chief of Detectives Kelly of San Diego Police Department, accompanied by District Attorney Whelan, go to Utah secure extradition papers, and bring Durant back. In the San Diego jail, the detectives questioned Durant. Well, Durant, it's been a long chase. You've made a lot of people plenty sore at you. Well, if it hadn't been for that mug in the clothing store, you guys never would have found me. Oh, I think we would. You fellas can stay away just so long, and then you're bound to make a slip. Yours was in taking up the shoplifting racket. Well, I never would have been in this mess if that guy at the theater hadn't made a pass for his gun. He didn't have any gun. That was another of those mistakes I've been telling you about. All he was trying to do was to get the new combination of the safe out of his vest pocket. On the level? Sure, he didn't have a gun. You were just a little too nervous. Gee, if I'd only known that, I wouldn't be here. I'd have gotten the dough, and all you guys would have on me is a robbery. Boy... Was I dumb? With the perfect case our officers had built against Durant, plus his previous criminal record, including a dishonorable discharge from the Navy and a term at Alcatraz, the killer didn't have a chance. He threw himself upon the mercy of the court and pleaded guilty to murder on March 10, 1933. District Attorney Whalen asked a supreme penalty, but on March 14th, the court sentenced Durant to Folsom Penitentiary for life. Thank you, Chief Sears. Ladies and gentlemen, the last word in the scientific manufacture of gasoline is the Sinclair cracking process, which is used by the Rio Grande Oil Company, a Sinclair company to create Rio Grande cracked gasoline especially for motoring conditions in California and Arizona. This cracking process makes a livelier gasoline. It fires at the flash of the spark, winning for Rio Grande crack the title of fastest starting gasoline. Because cracking breaks up the atoms of energy, you get a steady, more powerful push on the piston with Rio Grande crack. Whereas with uncracked gasolines, you get a sharp pound that causes vibration and knocking. You can get greater speed from Rio Grande crack. And that's why this gasoline is preferred by so many police departments of California and Arizona cities. Wherever it is sold, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment than any other brand. San Diego police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 56 regarding a murder. Suspect now in custody. That's all. Calling all cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>